Hello and welcome to the Institute of World Politics 7th Annual Student Symposium. My name is Sebastian Smerano. I am the current editor-in-chief of IWP's newest student publication, namely the journal Statecraft, and I will serve as your moderator for today's event. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Institute of World Politics is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's programs, um, 18 certificates of study, a doctoral program, and two new online Master of Arts programs. So if you're interested in learning more, we invite you to visit us at iwp.edu. So for this seventh annual uh, student symposium, four IWP students, Emily Miller, Caroline Hickey, Maria Calderoni, and Hannah Wilk, will be presenting research papers from their studies here. I'm especially happy uh, to get to moderate today's panel because each of tonight's speakers has had their research papers selected for this inaugural issue of the Statecraft Journal, which our phenomenal team of editors is preparing to launch at the end of this month. So if you're not on our IWP mailing list already, please make sure you sign up on our website so we can let you know when it is published. Our next presenter is uh, Caroline Hickey, who will be speaking on Muqtada al-Sadr, and the Mahdi army, friend or foe. Caroline is a graduate student at IWP where she's pursuing a master's degree in statecraft and international affairs. Her regional interest is in the Middle East and has focused her studies on Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm also grateful that she is our graphic designer uh, and our director for the upcoming statecraft journal. So Caroline, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here as I have a PowerPoint to share with you all. So please let me know if you can see it. Um, we are good. Okay, perfect. So uh, today my presentation is on Muqtada al-Sadr and Jaysh al-Badi in Iraq. And this is a research project that I started in Prof Professor Muravchek's class, Ideas and Values, about a year ago, where I was interested in a political coalition between uh, Muqtada's political party and, an Ira and the Iraqi Communist Party uh, in the 2018 election in Iraq. Uh, Iraq is known for their sectarian divides, so I wanted to learn more about this coalition between moderate Shia Islamists and uh, democratic secularists. So I continued this research project in Professor Danis's Violent Non-State Actors class uh, fall semester, and uh, this is an updated presentation of that. Uh, so Jay Shalmadi, which I will be referring to as J.M., uh, it means Army of Mahdi, which is who is a prominent figure, uh, historical figure in Shia Islam. And this is relevant to today because uh, the Biden administration's plan is to remain in Iraq to prevent an ISIS resurgence and to promote stability. And in my opinion, al-Sadr is a key in Iraqi stability and could also deter Iranian influence in Iraq. So who is Muqtada al-Sadr? So he, uh, you have to, to understand who he is, you have to understand the foundation that he built on. He is the youngest son of Ayatollah Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr and the son-in-law of Ayatollah Muhammad Bakir al And both men hold great importance to Iraqi Shias, uh, and they were prominent Shia leaders during the Baathist rule in Iraq. And they're known as the first and second martyrs. So father-in-law Ayatollah Muhammad Bakir al was arrested in 1980 and uh, by Saddam Hussein and executed because he, would, uh, he was feared to become the Khomeini of Iraq. And, uh, leading him to be called the first martyr. Uh, Muqtada's father, Ayatollah Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr, uh, was known to his followers as the White Lion and was allegedly assassinated uh, with two of his sons in 1999, uh, leading him to be known as the second martyr. Uh, Sadiq's followers are the ones who first started using the term Saturdist, and uh, this is a term that Muqtada and his followers still use today. Uh, and after the death of his father, Muqtada was not expected to be the heir of the Saturdist movement, um, let alone be involved in politics, but he is incredibly popular among poor Shias and um, is you know, a prominent political figure now. 
Uh, he was very unpopular in the beginning of the Iraq war. Uh, he was called the most dangerous man in Iraq, as you can see here in this Newsweek uh, cover page. Um, and one of the reasons is because of his militia, Jaysh al-Mahdi, in which is now known as the peace companies. So Jaysh al-Mahdi, J.M., uh, they were formed in 2003 after uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein. And uh, they lacked organization like other militias established in Iraq at the time, but their driving component was the dedication to Muqtada. Other militias had been trained in Iran, but uh, JM had not, but they had received aid because uh, Iran was trying to buy influence in the region. Uh, so they acted as a security force to protect uh, satirist mosques and defend Shias from Sunni extremist groups like uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, I like this quote here, if you don't have a militia, you're not in politics in Iraq. It, it really uh, emphasized the sentiment that was going on uh, in the country. So in 2008, they were reformed to Muma Hadun, which means the ones who pave the path. Um, at this point, it was more for community service than a security force. And then in 2014, reformed once again to be called the peace companies to specifically fight ISIS. Um, and you can really look at uh, JM's history in three separate parts. Um, as I've, I've kind of coined this first part is the U.S. adversary era in between 2003 and 2008. Um, JM had two strongholds in Shia majority areas. So in Sadr City in Baghdad and in Najat. And uh, JM is known for the uh, battle against U.S. troops in uh, Najat in uh in 2004, um, there's been there have been no major battles since then. And actually, after that specific clash was an agreement to a ceasefire. Um, but JM's control over Baghdad is one of the reasons for the U.S. surge in 2007 in the country. Um, but when that happened, Muqtada did not want to fight and had JM stand down. Uh, so in this time frame, we're also looking at. Uh, in 2006, specifically, starting to see more sectarian violence um, and use of death squads. And some of JM's units went rogue during this time and have been accused of committing such violent acts against Sunnis. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting because Muqtada has always discouraged sectarian divides. So, But it has been speculated that he secretly encouraged these violent acts. But some of these speculations... It, exist to discredit Muqtada, as his possession has always been from the beginning, to promote a united Iraq. Um, and around 2006, 2007, he, he really loses control of JM because of these rogue units. Uh, an example is in, uh, in 2007, uh, some of these units fought against the Badr Brigade, which is actually another Shia militia group. Um, so Muqtada shut down all JM movements for six months because it, it, they were no longer following him. Um, so if we're looking at kind of this 2008 to 2014 time frame, this is when it was uh, reinvented as uh, the Muma Hadun, uh, meaning the ones who paved the path. Uh, this is the community service aspects. Uh, this is also when there was speculation that Muqtada had left for Iran in 2006, but it is more widely believed that he was uh, in Iran between 2008 and 2000, between 2008 and 2011. Uh, it is at this point, I would like to point out that Muqtada is staunchly anti-Iranian, specifically when it comes to Iranian involvement in Iraqi politics. He is an Iraqi nationalist through and through. And some of these rumors have been started by his adversaries to discredit him. And some of these rumors are specifically about splinter groups who did turn to Iran for help. Um, but one of the reasons they turned to Iran for help was for aid, because as a splinter group, they were significantly underfunded. Um, so uh, jumping into 2014, this is when Muqtada reinvents the militia as the peace companies to fight the so-called Islamic State. Uh, and that kind of brings us more into the present day. So the last major battle that the peace companies fought was against ISIS in Tikrit in 2015. Um, he Muqtada has threatened 
to revive the peace companies twice since then, once in 2016 and then once again in 2020 to protect, uh, specifically to protect Iraqis from a potential war between the United States and Iran after the assassination of Iranian Quds Force leader uh, Soleimani. Uh, the, and today, and as I referenced earlier, uh, the Saturdists have always been involved in politics since 2003. But as I mentioned before, with the recent formation of the coalition group with the Iraqi communists, uh, this coalition is called Sirun, which is also known as Alliance Towards Reform. Um, they won 54 seats of 329 in parliament, um, and their whole goal is to seek to cross sectarian divides. Uh, this alliance is actually strongly discouraged by Iran, kind of proving that they're not as, these rumors are a little, they're definitely more rumors than anything. Um, and so, uh, but Muqtada remains anti-US and anti-Iran, which is a reflection of many Iraqi sentiments. So if we're looking into strategy recommendations, um, the US strategy should, excuse me, uh, uh, dog in the background, <laughs> should incorporate Muqtada and the peace companies um, because there's similar goals of deterring Iranian influence and wanting and both wanting a stable Iraq. Uh, a democratic Iraq would mean an independent Iraq, which is intimidating for the United States because then there's less control. Um, and it's even more uncomfortable knowing that a prominent political leader like Muqtada is anti-US. But there is solace in the fact that he's anti-Iran too, and that he's a nationalist. So these goals can, you know, align with what our goals are for Iraq as well. Um, what already exists is the U.S.-Iraq Strategic F Framework Agreement, and it looks to build up uh, Iraq's defense capabilities, but it should be reassessed to then prioritize productive goals, um, like building up the Iraqi infrastructure, uh, national, like a national security force, um, because if there's one, then there would be no need for independent and rogue militias. Um, there is a need for a balance to make sure U.S. national security goals are met, but not to really anger people like Muqtada because that would be counterproductive. Um, so in this case, Muqtada should not be considered an adversary, but I wouldn't go as far as calling him a partner because he doesn't want that. Um, but it, it needs to be, uh, I, I would like to <laughs> reinforce the idea that Shia, uh, Iraqi Shias are not loyal to Iran. Um, they uh, and the fact that that exists, that thought process exists from American perspective is uh, dangerous and ill-informed because uh, that idea that you know Iraqi Shias prioritize Irani, Iranian goals more than Iraqi uh, is actually that thought process is what has driven Iraq a little more into the hands of Iran than we'd like to admit. Um, so if we if we work with people who have similar goals with us, like Muqtada, then it's more of an opportunity for a friendly democratic Iraq going forward. So that can conclude my presentation. Thank you. I'd like to open up to any questions. Thank you, Caroline. There you are. I had a technical glitch. Thanks so much. That was a great presentation. Um, the first question uh, says, how would we, you, reconcile Muqtada as anti-Iran and Unitarian in Iraq with the fact that he completed his Mullah studies in Iran as a staunch Shia who is anti-Sunni? So the question is, I guess, maybe with that of it, it, are we underestimating and underestimating that connection? I don't want to put words in the questioner's mouth, but no, no, no. And I, I think it's a very good point, and one that is very. It was very hard to um, do research on because, as I as I mentioned, like he probably was in Iran for you know from two thousand eight to two thousand eleven. So like, and there is a connection there. Um, and to me, what I'm dissecting it from is that you know he's there for religious purposes. He's there for, you know, connections that he has, but he's, he doesn't want Iran involved in politics and he doesn't want a puppet government in Iraq. And so I think having to look at 
some of these sources of, you know, the speculations of like, where is that coming from? And then also just like, what, is he actually being influenced by people uh, that would then, you know, be counterproductive for our national security goals, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes. Uh, and, you know, speaking of sources, um, it, uh, so first of all, it's very difficult not to notice that that when it comes to men, they, they do play a very big role in the narrative in that in that part of the world. Um, it, it's um, did you find in your research that the inf the information that you got from let's say uh, non domestic sources and those from our domestic sources was similar different? Was it how did you have to reconcile anything? Was there anything surprising? Yeah, it was. There's not a lot of sources kind of after 2008, uh, which was very frustrating, especially because a lot of, you know, media sources were really regurgitating the same thing without mm -hmm. being educated. And, that, and that's not to say that like they were necessarily wrong, but it was just a lot of the same thing right. again and again. Um, I, I found a book by Patrick uh, Cockburn, which he is a, uh, British journalist, and he's written in English, probably one of the better uh, resources on Muqtada. And so his points were kind of like, look at, understand the lens that some of these sources were coming from. Like, as I said, like, Muqtada was the most dangerous man in Iraq, according to the United States in 2007. So, so the sources are going to be biased by that mm -hmm. for good reason. I mean, they fought our troops and it, you know, it, from 2003 to 2008 wasn't really a great time. Um, but at the same time, like, for me, one thing that is significant and why I kind of went into this research is like, you have to understand like what the Iraqis perspective was, especially Shia Iraqis, you know, coming out of a regime that had been oppressing them for so long and finally had this, you know, rubber band effect of like a freedom for once, but then going straight into a civil war and the United States being there as well. Uh, so yeah, it was very difficult to find sources that I could trust. Um, and one thing that I would really, I think the reason I liked Patrick Cockburn's book was because he was in Iraq talking to people. Uh, and that's something that would be a goal of mine as well to, you know, go and get that, you know, first sources. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have, um, so I'm kind of jumping between chat and Q&A, and, and, but these are great. Um, circa 2003, Iraqi Sunni leaders voiced concern with Iran's being a political subsidiary of Iran. Um, and uh, it seems like this was a very trusted source who was in some of these meetings. The question is, are Sunnis more reconciled to JM today? I would say that's a goal. of. <laughs> I would say that's a goal of the Saturnists. Um, the interesting thing that I started with this uh, project was learning that with JAM, they are kind of this wing of the Saturnist group. Mm. And they, the violence that was mostly done against, the militia aspects were mostly done as a defense mechanism. And then the offensive ones were specifically in the beginning in 2003, like I mentioned. Um, but these, you know, small splinter groups are the ones that are mostly creating creating violence towards Sunnis. And I think I don't want to speak for Iraqi Sunnis. It seems like I think some understand that there's a desire for crossing uh, sectarian lines, and that JM isn't really a Shia militia anymore. That it's more of a, you know, uh, it's fighting ISIS. You know, a, a group that is also killing. Sunnis like it's it, it's a group that it, it's defense at this point if that makes sense yeah sure um Mr. Uh, Dale Benedict if and, and I'm I feel free to mention his whole name because he is presenting himself as a primary resource by the way so if you do want to reach out to uh Dale Benedict uh, or Miss Benedict if you want to reach out to IWP we can put you in touch with Callan if you're a primary resource for that and he does say that actually there's significant sources post 2000 like look at human terrain system writings for example if that helps anybody who's interested in this topic um if there are no more 
questions. Caroline, thank you. I certainly, certainly enjoy this presentation. And, and I, as, as you very well know, uh, I'm very interested in, in um, the effect that individuals have in, uh, in geopolitical issues. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, as, as we've said in our conversations, I'm not sure we pay uh, enough attention to, to single actors. Uh, um, and I was very excited to get to, to read your paper and I can't wait to see it in print in uh, in the journal. Yes, of course. So, thank you for everything you do, Sebastian. Thanks uh, for thank everything. You, Cheers. Thank you.